What's up, everybody? Matt Gajeski here. Happy holidays for myself and the Awesome team. We are here breaking down some college football DFS ahead of Christmas Day. We have a single bowl game. It is Georgia State taking on Ball State. And before we get started, make sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you know when this and all other content goes live. But without further ado, let's break down this game. Single games, we have showdown, and it's an interesting one overall. Ball State is a six-point underdog against Georgia State. The total is 51 points. Clashing styles here. Neither team's particularly fast, but we look at Ball State. They're a team running 68 and a half plays per game. Georgia State is at 71. But the main difference is the pass rate for these teams. So Ball State, they're throwing the ball 51% of the time. Georgia State is at 36 and a half. So for DFS purposes, pretty interesting game overall. Luckily, Georgia State's main weakness on defense is against the pass. So Drew Plitt stands out as a player who's attractive in this spot. 150 yards on the ground, so he's somewhat mobile. As a passer, he's only averaging 187 per game. But he does get off 30 and a half attempts. So there is some upside for Plitt in this spot. Hopefully the total can remain around 51 or eclipse that for Plitt to potentially hit his ceiling. But ultimately, the lack of rushing ability makes Plitt more interesting in something like the utility spot because he is really expensive here. And as we'll get to, it's a very condensed offense. So there's the potential for some of these other options, skill position players to outscore Plitt based on PBR volume, touchdown volume, things like that. So Plitt, safe play, but maybe not the most upside in the run game, Carson Steele was formerly in a timeshare with Will Jones, but this has fully become the Carson Steele show. He's at at least 20 carries in four straight games. You can see he's only averaging 15.6 touches on the year, but that has drastically moved in favor of Steele down the stretch. And he's completely out carrying Will Jones right now. Will Jones hasn't had more than three carries in four straight games. And even the pass game role is starting to become mixed a little more. Will Jones was formerly the pass catching back, but he's actually been out targeted by one target, albeit, but he's been out targeted by Steele in the past game over the last two weeks. So this is a formal changing of the guard here. Carson Steele's a fantastic play. The only worry is they're underdogs in this game. And by six points, a near touchdown spread, that's the only worry you have here. For the receivers, Jay Sean Jackson, Johannes Tyler, Justin Hall are the main options. First of all, you have... Justin Hall, coming back from an injury, he missed their second most recent game, participated in about 35, 40% of the, the routes in their most recent contest. But on the year, he's their most targeted receiver on a per-game basis, 7.4 per game. Jay Sean Jackson, he's recently jumped up to 7.5, but most of that is the result of the Justin Hall injury. So one thing to worry about here is Justin Hall maybe still not being fully healthy, but ultimately Hall is so involved in the offense that I don't really know if it matters He's also involved on the ground. He has 30, 37 carries this year and 255 rushing yards. Hall is their number one playmaker, and he's so involved in the offense that he's somebody we should be looking at. And he's one of the reasons that maybe you see somebody outscore Drew Plitt at quarterback. But J Jay Sean Jackson, we just mentioned him. He took on an immense role down the stretch without Justin Hall. He, he was used in kind of the Justin Hall role. He had three carries, but we see 26 targets over the last two games. That should come back down with Hall getting a little healthier. But still, I think Jay Sean Jackson's fully asserted himself as the wide receiver, too, for this team. And he's the cheapest of the bunch. So he's the best cost-adjusted play. Then you have Johannes Tyler. He's more your possession-style receiver. Only 36.5 yards per game for him. But he's still averaging seven targets on the year. Interestingly, he's more expensive than Jackson. So I don't love the price on him. But he's certainly in play. And they basically only use three receivers. Cody Rudy's listed at running back. But he's actually their, their tight end. So this is something that we should focus on here. Not a lot of work for him, 2.3 targets per game, but he's the stone minimum. So, I mean, you're going to have to play somebody cheap and Ball State doesn't exactly have a lot of these guys involved. Some of the other players that are on the field occasionally, Trevor Holt, Jordan Williams, Jalen McGahey, Hassan Littles. These guys are on the field here and there. You're just probably not going to get a big score out of them, but for GPPs, maybe they differentiate you. Among those players, look at Littles. He played the most when Hall went down. For Georgia State, they dealt with some transfers this year. They lost Cornelius Brown. They lost Destin Coates to the portal. So Darren Granger, he's locked in as the starting quarterback here. And he has something that Plitt does not. Very good rushing ability, 553 yards on the ground for him. Again, they only throw the ball 36.5% of the time. So you're just not going to get the passing volume with Granger. 138 passing yards per game on 19 attempts. But the rushing floor is very good for him. So 
As far as price adjusted plays, I view him a little bit the same as Plitt, just limited upside unless he's the one that punches in rushing touchdowns. So I think you can get some cheaper options that you might like a little bit more. In particular, this Georgia State team as favorites will run the ball incessantly. And you have a committee, but their run rate is so high that both Tucker Gregg and Jameis Williams have elite opportunity in this offense. Tucker Gregg averages 14.9 touches per game, but he hasn't seen fewer than 17 touches in, in four straight games. And Williams hasn't seen fewer than 11, and he's been at least 15 in three of their last four. So when this team is ahead, they are going to pound the ball on the ground. For your reference, Greg has 920 yards on the ground this year. Williams has 785. And then again, Granger is 553. That's a ton of rushing production. And Greg and Jameis Williams are both pretty cheap. Neither of them are above 10K in the captain spot. So risky, you don't know who's going to get the touchdowns, but ultimately it's a spot where there's a lot of risk, but a lot of reward. In the receiving game, this has been a pretty nasty rotation for a while here. So I kind of want to reference what they've done of late. They've had injuries at certain points, but it has narrowed a little bit lately. The number one receiver for this team, and I think without a doubt really, is going to be Sam Pinckney. He's the leader on the year when you're not, not like not factoring in injuries. So he's been he's been very good from that point of view. And he's the only one playing like 90% of snaps. So Pinckney, I think he makes the most sense. Again, only 48 targets, but he battled some injury. He's averaging six targets per game over the last four, which is pretty clearly the number one in this offense. And then from there, you're dealing with a situation where Jamari Thrash and Josias Credle kind of split time on the outside against each other. So neither of them is a complete full-time player, and that's kind of ebbed and flowed between them. Thrash is the leader on the year. Eight targets over their most recent games. Credle has six, but you've seen this ebb and flow a lot. So as far as price-adjusted plays, prefer Credle a little bit there. But ultimately, that's going to be a tough situation to decipher and then from there, the slot receiver job has been increasingly difficult to decipher. You have Terrence Dixon, Cornelius McCoy, and Robert Lewis all playing. McCoy played a pivotal role for this team earlier in the season, so his price, that's why. He still hasn't seen more than three targets in three straight games, making him very expensive for his cost. I don't love that. But again, from there, you're also going to have Cornelius McCoy splitting time with Terrence Dixon, who's kind of taken a back seat as well. He hasn't seen a single target in the last two games, but he had five before that. He is still playing. I checked the snap counts. Dixon's been on the field, so he just hasn't received a target. And then again, you have Robert Lewis mixing in as well, who hasn't been targeted. He wasn't targeted in their last game, but he's averaging one target per game of the year. So that slot receiver job is a pretty nasty rotation. To finish out Georgia State, they used two tight ends. Roger Carter is about a 60% player to Aubrey Payne, 40%. And that's the split you see in the target distribution. But ultimately, it's very close. But Roger Carter holds the edges and yardage targets, targets over the last four, but it's pretty close. I think Aubrey Payne is a decent punt. The same thing goes for Carter. But overall, that is the game. Thank you guys for watching. Let me know in the comments section who your favorite plays are. Otherwise, we'll continue to accompany you through bowl season. I'm Matt Gajeski on Twitter, at Matt underscore Gajeski. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you again.